much for talking to no, me. No, thanks for being here. You know, you got a great review in the New York Times for your book. You also got a review by Donald Trump on Twitter, which was less positive. He's called you a proven leaker and a liar, a weak and untruthful slime ball. And he said, it was my great honor to fire James Comey, exclamation point. What do you think of that? Yeah, I saw that. I don't follow him on Twitter, but I saw the tweets. And I'm not going to get back, get into a back and forth with him over that. I hope people will read the book and then make up their own minds. Because uh, I talk in the book about my strengths, my weaknesses, and try to tell a complete story. And folks can make their own judgments. Well, just one last thing on that point. President Trump's attacked you. The RNC has put up a, a website to attack you called calling lying, lying, uh, lying Comey. Um, are you prepared for the onslaught that is going to face you with the publication of this book? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm prepared to do is just try to be myself, try to be honest and transparent and let people make their own decisions. And I think it's lying with no G. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you looked at that website? No. Do you feel like you're on a mission as part of this, uh, this project? And if so, what is it? I don't think of it as a mission, but I think I have an obligation to try to drive a healthy conversation is how I think about it. I learned from my wife long ago that when something bad happens, you should try to make something good come from it. I learned that in the context of the loss of our son, Colin. And this is nowhere near that, but something bad happened. I was fired from a job that I loved and a place that I loved working. And the good I hope to come out of it is me to offer a vision to people, especially young people, about what ethical leadership is, what it should look like. I'm not one, I'm not perfect, but I'm trying to offer a contribution to a national conversation that we have to have. What should leadership be? That, so I don't really think of it as a mission, I think of it as an obligation. And you portray uh, President Trump as someone who is, I think your phrase is, untethered from the truth, as someone who is not an ethical leader. Do you think he is uh, unfit for the Oval Office? I don't think he's mentally, mentally unfit. I've read stuff about that he's, you know, this bit about dementia and whatnot. I don't buy that. I, he seems to be a person of above average intelligence. He follows, tracks a conversation, all those kinds of things. That's not what I mean. I actually believe he's morally unfit to be president. And I say that because someone who is able to see moral equivalence in Charlottesville or to speak and treat women like they're pieces of meat and to lie constantly, and who appears to lack an external moral framework. Right? Most leaders, all leaders that I've known, have some sort of external framework. They, they make the hardest decisions by touching a religious tradition or philosophy or logic or history or tradition. I never saw any of that with Donald Trump. The only reference point is internal. What will bring me the affirmation that I so badly crave? That collection of attributes makes a person morally unfit to be a leader, no less the President of the United States. When, when did you make that conclusion? When, when did you come to that determination? How soon after meeting him that you felt that way? I don't know. It, I think it, it was a, it's dawning slowly, and I don't know until I sat down to collect my thoughts in connection with this book. I don't think I synthesized it like that. But I, as I look back, I can see it dawning on me all through the first part of 2017. And this uh, image, this very striking image that you make in the book of likening President Trump to uh, a leader of an organized crime boss, did that occur to you very soon after meeting with President Trump? Is it something that uh, that image evolved in your head over time? Yeah, the, the comparison to the leadership of a Cosa Nostra family, a mafia family, actually started to hit me right away. And I thought it was so dramatic that I... I thought that can't be so, push it away, push it away, push it away, and it kept coming back. Not in the sense that I think Donald Trump is out breaking legs or shaking down shopkeepers or sticking up a union, but in the sense that the leadership culture is very similar. It's all focused on the boss. What is done in this family must serve the boss, and you are judged entirely by your feelings. That comparison, because of my life experience, kept coming back to me, kept coming back to me, and started very early. That, that implication, though, of a crime figure, um, you must have thought about that before putting it down. 
in, in writing. Um, what did you think about um, before you made that comparison? Did you think about the blowback that you would get for that? Sure, I think it's a dramatic comparison, which is why when it first popped into my head, I pushed it away and pushed it away. But the more I've thought about it, again, I'm not saying he's out committing the crimes of a mafia leader, but the leadership culture and style is actually very similar. And that's why it kept popping back into my head. So look, I, I knew when I wrote it that people might index on it, but if I didn't say it, I wouldn't be honest, and I'm trying to be honest. This is not a subject you deal with in your, in your book, but do you think President Trump has been compromised by the Russians? I don't know. And these are words I never thought would come out of my mouth about an American president, but it's possible. I'm not saying it's likely. I, I don't know, and the honest answer is it's possible. It's hard to explain some things without at least leaving your mind open to that being a possibility. What is the possibility that you see? What's the greatest possibility that he was? Well, obviously, the most likely is that he's not. But the reason I say possible is that there's a non-zero possibility that the Russians have some, some sway over him that is rooted in his personal experience. And I don't know whether that's the business about the activity in a Moscow hotel room or finances or something else. But again, I, I'm, I don't want to overstate it. I'm not saying it's likely. I'm saying, to be honest with you, I have to say it's possible. And if you'd asked me two years ago, would I ever say that about an American president? Of course not. That would never happen. But the honest answer is it's possible. And that's because of the attitude he's taken toward Russia and not generally declining to criticize Russia or Putin. Uh, that's in his response to the Russian meddling in our election. All that adds up to you to be raised the possibility that he's been compromised. Right. That plus one other piece, which to me is very important, at least in my experience, he won't criticize Vladimir Putin, even in private, even in a meeting with three people in the Oval Office. He is arguing that he gave a good answer when he said, essentially, we are the same kind of killers that Putin's thugs are. And that struck me because I can understand why a president might want to. It's important to have a good relationship, even with adversaries. Why a president might not want to criticize publicly another leader. But privately, sitting with the person in charge of countering the Russia threat in the United States, privately not being willing to do that, that that always struck me. The, the, uh, just on the dossier and the, and the salacious allegations in the dossier, he was, President Trump really reacted to that, uh, in your experience, to the, the, uh, with great concern and pushback on the idea that he had engaged in that behavior in a, in a Moscow hotel room. Did, that, did his response surprise you? Maybe not in the moment, because his response was to interrupt me and very strongly deny it, which is reasonable in, in my experience. The continuing focus on it surprised me. Because again, I, I probably have too dark a view of the world having been in the criminal investigation business most of my life, but when someone constantly brings up to deny something you're not asking about, that's an interesting fact. And there's all kinds, I think I put in the book the proverb, only the guilty flee where no man pursues. And and so that struck me. And so that was an accumulation of things. But the initial denial um, seemed reasonable to me. And he also mentions uh, Melania Trump uh, in response to that, that he wants to reassure her. Did, that, did, did you make anything of, of that? Did that seem a sincere thing? Was that an excuse? But, I mean, what, what did you make of, the, of his, his references to, to his wife in that case? I think they were genuine. And they... They both surprised me and distracted me. And I, again, I'm trying to tell the reader exactly what I was thinking and what, what I was dealing with. But I remember almost losing track of the conversation at one point when he said, if there's even a 1% chance that my wife believes this is true. Because I remember then going off on a little side trail in my own head thinking, how could there be a 1% chance your wife thinks you're with prostitutes doing that in a Moscow hotel room? I'm a flawed character, but I'm highly confident my wife would say there's literally a zero chance that my husband did that. And so I remember thinking, what kind of man and what kind of relationship does your wife think there's only a 99% chance you didn't do this? And then I, I, 
I know this happens to you, but then I got back to the conversation. And so again, I'm trying to be as full and transparent as possible. And so I included that description of what I was distracted by. He, he's made it pretty clear that he would like to fire Mueller and, and or Rosenstein. What would be the effect of that decision? And would it curtail the investigation? Well, the most important effect would be, it would be an attack on the rule of law that we have not seen in our lifetime. And talk about a core value of America, truth, the rule of law, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, fairness, decency, that's who we are. And if the president can fire an independent prosecutor who's working within the chain of command in the Justice Department because he doesn't like the result they may be headed towards, that is a fundamental attack on the rule of law. So that's the most important thing. All of us should care about that. Again, this is above politics, above party affiliation, because it's all we are as a country. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I don't know exactly what the practical effect would be. In a way, he'd have to fire everyone in the FBI and the Justice Department because of the nature of those organizations. And so there are no indispensable people. Firing me didn't change the nature of the FBI. Those folks will pursue the truth. But should there be consequences to that action? And by that I mean, is there an obligation uh, in Congress to see that or view that as a red line for impeachment? I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that. What I, what I know for sure is it should be, if that were to happen, it should be a wake up call, a blaring alarm for everybody, regardless of your political affiliation that that is something the American people and their representatives should care deeply about because that is an attack on who we are. So you, have, you are in a unique position here because you have already been fired by Donald Trump. So if he fires either uh, Robert Mueller or Rod Rosenstein, what is your advice to them? What should they do? Hmm. I don't know that I'm qualified to give it because it depends upon the person and how they process things like that. And so I don't know either of them well enough to know how they might think about it and what the realm of possibilities would be. I don't know whether to tell them, you ought to go out and speak, you ought to write a book. I don't know. And so that would be an individual judgment for them. But would it, would it I mean, it, it, it would seem like, I mean, you know, you know Mueller pretty well. Um, what, would be, uh, what would be his reaction, do you think? I don't know. I don't know him as well as people keep saying I know him. I mean, I like him and I respect him. But I don't know his children's names. He doesn't know mine. I've never been to the man's house. He's never mm -hmm. been to mine. So I don't know for sure what his reaction would be. What I know about him from his work is he is what the country would want in someone in this position. And he cares deeply about those values that I talked about. He is an American through and through. And so I know it would be deeply troubling to him. But I don't know what his reaction would be on, on a personal level. I just don't. You, uh, you write kind of critically of Attorney General Sessions and Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein in your book. Um, but in recent days, uh, some people think they've been trying to stand up to President Trump uh, in, in some ways. And I wonder, if have you been reassured, since you finished the book, I know there's some lag time, have you been reassured by how they behave, or do you continue to have concerns about whether they're willing to stand up for the traditional independence of the Justice Department? I think the Deputy Attorney General has uh, performed in a good way since my firing. And, and I don't know this, but I suspect part of it is to make up for what he did in connection with my firing. But I, what I've seen him do, which is stand up for the rule of law, and the Justice Department and the need for independent law enforcement to resist the president saying, prosecute that person, don't prosecute that person, don't come after me, has been really good and really important. And would you, would you say the same of uh, Attorney General Sessions? I've seen less there because he's recused, and so I don't, I don't see him, which is appropriate, I don't see him interacting and talking about that, that stuff. You know, you've done a rare thing. You have united Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. Uh, They're both uh, very critical of you. Um, and Democrats, I think, who support Hillary Clinton and who, like Hillary Clinton, blame you for her defeat in 2016, have focused on a passage uh, of your book um, in particular. And this is this passage on page 204. It is entirely possible that because I was making decisions in an environment where Hillary Clinton was sure to be the next president, my concern about making her an illegitimate president by concealing 
the restarted investigation into her, into her emails bore greater weight than it would have if the election appeared closer or if Donald Trump were ahead in the polls, but I don't know. Their, I think their criticism is that you did affect the election and you did help elect uh, Donald Trump by your actions. Do you think that is a fair critique you've had? That email investigation had been reopened. I think it's fair to question my decisions, to criticize my decisions in all kinds of ways. I think folks, I hope people read that full paragraph you just read because Again, I'm trying to be complete with the reader. I don't remember thinking about the polls. I don't remember thinking about, in fact, I tried to push it away. But my point there is the oxygen around all of us was Hillary Clinton's going to be the next president. And I'm just asking myself and the reader, could that have influenced me in some way? I don't remember it influencing me, but I think I'd be an idiot not to at least look at the environment in which I operated. But look, I get why people have been concerned, criticized. I, I never wanted to, and it's incredibly painful to think I've actually united them all uh, in criticizing me. One of my kids during that time sent me a tweet. I stayed off Twitter during that time, a tweet that said, that Comey is such a political hack. I just can't figure out which party. And in a way, that's a compliment, but also demonstrates the pain of this whole situation. I hope what people will see in the book is what I think President Obama saw, someone trying to make decisions without regard to politics, by thinking about, so what are the values of the institutions that we're supposed to be representing? And which is the least bad alternative? All of this was a 500 year flood. I pray no FBI director ever has to deal with this again, because it was just a series of no win decisions. And so which would be the least bad decision is constantly what we're thinking in the book. And my hope is, I even hope Hillary Clinton at least reads those parts of the book, because I think she will walk away saying, you know what? I still think that guy's an idiot, but you know, he's kind of an honest idiot. And he's trying to do the right thing here. And I kind of get actually what he was faced with. I'm not trying to talk people into my point of view, but at least have them see, because this is a book about leadership. This is someone who's a leader trying to make a decision in an ethical way. And whether you agree or not with the decision, I hope you walk away saying, oh, I actually now see he wasn't on Donald Trump's side or Hillary Clinton's side. He wasn't on anybody's side, which is in part why everyone is mad at him. There's a, uh, something very provocative in your, in your book, which is you say that one of the things that affected your decision making was some classified information about Loretta Lynch that indicates that she uh, that would raise questions about her impartiality in dealing with the Hillary Clinton investigation. Is this information that has not yet been released in any form? Correct. And so, Kevin, I was asking Kevin, our expert, uh, about what it could be. He had some theories, but it... Yeah, it, it's, it's not the Russian intelligence document that contains uh, a reference to email that Loretta Lynch would not uh, go far uh, into the Clinton investigation. Are, you're not referring to that? I can't say. I'm not referring to anything. You're, yeah, I can't say. You're not I, and I've gone as far, because the FBI has reviewed my book, and it's, I'm as far forward as I can be. Uh, given the classified nature of the material. But it's not something we've read about in the newspaper. This is something that's not been released yet. I don't want to, I don't know exactly what's been in the media, but it's not been released. Did the uh, FBI take much out of your book? No, because I wrote, because I used to be the director. <laughs> I wrote it pretty carefully, trying to make sure I didn't touch either classified information or sensitive investigative material. I've tried not to talk about any details of the Russia investigation. So I, I knew it had to be reviewed for pre-publication review and so very little. Some, they had me change some words and they fly spec very carefully how I talked about this material. And the, the special counsel, did he look, take a look at the book beforehand too? I don't know. But you didn't send it to, to Mueller to look I at I did it not. Yeah. And he raised no questions about the timing of this at all? I dealt with the FBI, no, I've dealt with the FBI pre-publication review office. So it's possible they showed it to other people, but I just don't know the answer. C continuing on, Hillary, just for a bit. Um, <clears throat> the IG, as we sit here, the IG report is, is pending. Have you seen it? No. Do you expect to get a copy of it for your own review before it's published? I think so. I think the normal drill is if you're a I don't know, if they're talking about your conduct, you get a chance to look at it and offer any response you want. Where is the FBI exposed on that? 
uh, in that report, do you think? I don't know. Um, part of the reason I hesitate is I don't know exactly all they're looking at. I know because I encouraged it. I wanted them to take a look at the decision making I did on the Hillary Clinton email investigation to do the July 5th press conference to notify Congress in late October. But I gather from media accounts that there's other pieces that they've added, but I don't have any personal knowledge of exactly what it is beyond uh, that piece about Hillary Clinton email. You, you haven't had a chance to comment on the email exchanges between two members of the investigative team um, uh, since those were revealed. Yeah. And um, how does that make you feel after you've, obviously, I'm sure you've seen them. Uh, what do you make of them? And uh, were you aware at the time that those emails were crossing? No. The text between Lisa Page and yeah. Pete Strzok, yeah, I had, I had no idea. It, it really bugs me. I think it's terrible judgment. Those are two very talented people. I never saw any, obviously, I never saw any indication they were having a relationship. I never saw any indication of any bias from either of them. But it's still just terrible judgment. And so I haven't read them all. I guess I should. But I've seen enough that I know that it's terrible judgment. And I can see why the special counsel made the decision to have, I think it was Peter Strzok first, off of the investigation. Mm -hmm. But does it, I mean, do you fear, though, that, now that out in public, um, it, it, or does it make you second guess, I guess, I, I guess the, um, the credibility of the Clinton investigation in your mind? It doesn't. It bugs me for lots of reasons, but it doesn't change my sense that the, we did that investigation in the right way. Look, Peter Strzok, who I keep hearing, is in the tank for Hillary Clinton, I think wrote the first draft of my letter to Congress for October 28th. And I sat with him all the time and always saw him as down the middle. Never saw any indication of bias. And the same with Lisa Page. I mean, Lisa Page was um, an outspoken person, which I liked mm -hmm. because I like disruption. There's a risk in a chain of command environment that everybody will just look and see what the boss wants to do. What I liked about Lisa Page is she didn't really care what anybody else thought. And so she would interrupt, she would interject, which was great. I mean, bugged people, I think, but it was great because it. It shook up the chain of command. And so that's what I mean when I say I never saw any indication of bias on their part. And it doesn't change my view of the, of the case. But the FBI is a public trust organization. That, that we are impartial is obviously really important, the reality. But the perception of it is also important. And so this stuff with their, I mean, I guess they badmouthed everybody. They probably badmouthed me. I haven't gone through all the text. But that they're badmouthing candidates using FBI devices is just is terrible. There's one other thing that just has come up in the last few hours uh, that I want to ask you about, and that is reports that President Trump is seriously considering a, a pardon for, for Scooter Libby. Now, you have an actual connection to this case because you were the deputy attorney general who appointed the special prosecutor, uh, Patrick Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. who um, got a conviction of Scooter Libby uh, for um, perjury and obstruction. Else? Obstruction of justice. Perjury yeah. and obstruction of justice. If President Trump pardons Scooter Libby, do you think this is a signal to possible associates of his that he's got the pardon power if they stick with him in this current investigation? I don't know. I think it's another, if this were to happen, another attack on the rule of law. There's a reason that George W. Bush refused to pardon Scooter Libby. He examined that case really closely and I believe concluded what the jury concluded. There was overwhelming evidence that he intentionally and knowingly lied in the grand jury and to investigators. And I write about it in the book to try and underscore the importance of the truth in the criminal justice system. And so I don't know what the justification would be for pardoning Scooter Libby, especially after the president with whom he was the closest looked at it and said, I'm sorry, I can't do that, given the facts and the values at issue. You know, you're pretty recognizable because uh, you're so tall. You're, what, 6'8"? Yeah. And you're about to become more recognizable with all the interviews you're going to do for your book. Do people come up and confront you when you, like, go to the grocery store or you're standing in, in line at the airport? Not confront. I mean, haters seem to stay away. I've seen some people looking at a distance. <laughs> They didn't have love in their eyes, but the people who come up, and a lot of people come up, 
because you're a giraffe, you can't hide, uh, are really nice, really, really what nice. What do they say to you? They say things like, thank you. Thank you for telling it like it is. Thank you for being a person of integrity. And some of them just express pity. Sorry, sorry for all you had to go with. Sorry you're out of a job, that kind of stuff. But it's all warm, it really is. Could and, you I, ever... and I've experienced it all over the country. I experienced it, I was in Amsterdam, uh, walking down the street, I thought there, tallest nation on earth. It'd be like a nation of blue drapes for me. I could hide there. And I'm walking down the street, and a truck driven by an African immigrant uh, truck driver stops, the guy yells out the window, James Comey! <laughs> and jumps out of his truck with his coworker and wants pictures and wants to talk. And I'm like, ah, we can't even hide in Amsterdam.